This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Wednesday, April the 28th in the year 2010 at the Niles Public Library. My name is Neil O'Shea and I'm a member of the reference staff here at the library and I'm speaking with Mr. Charles Borowski. Mr. Borowski was born on June 6, 1927 and he now lives in Skokie. Uh, Mr. Borowski has kindly consented to be interviewed uh, for this project uh, and also accompanying Mr. Borowski here today and present in the room during the interview is uh, Mr. Charles Melodosian who served with Mr. Borowski in the uh, Merchant Marine and we're um, grateful for Mr. Borowski uh, coming in today on this beautiful afternoon because he's the first uh, veteran that we've had the opportunity to interview that served in the Merchant Marine. So, um, and he's promised to uh, enlighten us with some details and a history of this important American institution. Um, so, we'll begin now with our usual series of general questions and we'll ask Mr. Borowski, um, do you recall when you entered the service? Yes, uh, May 15th, 1945. May 15th, 1945. So that was World War II was still... World War II was still in there. Um, Germany had just uh, uh, declared, v we declared VE Day in Germany and I was on the train to California for uh, boot camp training uh, and uh, Japan was still an active combatant nation. Had you completed high school? Yes. I, I left high school early. They, they allowed uh, seniors in high school, if they would join the service, to, to leave early and get their degree, their, their uh, uh, diploma uh, sent to their homes in the mail. What, uh, what high school did you attend? Roosevelt High School in Chicago, Illinois. So you were a rough rider then? Yes, that was a rough rider. That school was over on... Uh, what is it? It's uh, on Kimball Kimball is Wilson and Crawford, or uh, Wilson and Kimball. Adams. Kimball, yeah. yeah. I think I interviewed another of that, Mr. Aronson. I think who went to Roosevelt. Yeah, Roosevelt. So why didn't you just stay home and, and get your degree? I mean, what, the war was over. What did you want to go in for? Well, the war wasn't over. It wasn't over. Well, it was going to. No, we didn't know that. We didn't know that. And uh, I had in 1941. I was uh, 14 years old. It was Pearl Harbor. And right after Pearl Harbor, I joined the National Guard. Uh, and uh, they found out I was underage. <laughs> and in order to expedite getting me out of the National Guard, they, they uh, gave me an honorable discharge. So I had an honorable discharge from the National Guard at 14 years old. How did your parents feel about your interest in things military? Uh, my father was very much in favor of it. My mother was very much against it. So when she found out what had happened, uh, she went down to the National Guard Armory and made such a complaint that uh, they, they finally decided that the best thing to do would be to issue, issue me a discharge. And then I tried to join up various services and she said that uh, if I would prove to her that I could get a high school diploma, that she would sign off and let me go wherever I wanted to go. And uh, I had tried to join the uh, Marine Corps. Uh, I tried to join the Royal Canadian Air Force because they were accepting uh, recruits at 16. Uh, the uh, Merchant Marine was accepting uh, applicants at, 14, at, at 16 years old. But um, uh, the reason I joined the uh, United States Merchant Marine Academy was that uh, it was officer training and we were uh, going to get a commission in the maritime service and a commission in the Navy simultaneously. So it was the, one of the last programs that was involved where you could get um, a, um, an officer's commission within a reasonable time. And uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, also the chance to go to sea was almost immediate. 
because the Merchant Marine Academy was the only federal academy in the United States that allowed midshipmen to go into wartime duty before they finished uh, their classroom work. So uh, I went to San Mateo, California, which was their boot camp training for the United States Merchant Marine Academy uh, at Kings Point, New York. And um, we were uh, given six weeks training, and then we were sent aboard a ship as a cadet midshipman. And then we were expected to serve a year at sea as a midshipman. We call, the, the correct term is cadet midshipman. So you were determined to enter the service, and right. you didn't mind if it was on land or sea. I didn't care. I just wanted to get something somewhere, I, or the air. Oh, you had been in the air. Wow. Yeah, I wanted. To, I was trying to get into the Royal Canadian Air Force because they were taking applicants at 16 years old. Was there a tradition of military service in your family? My father had joined the army when he was 16 years old. When he came, he came from Poland, and uh, he was in New York. He, uh, as soon as the war started, World War One started, he, he joined the army and was a, a frontline soldier for you know for the entire World War One. So. Uh, so he's part of the American Expeditionary yeah. Force, 1917. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this, uh, we're we're the only academy, we're the only federal academy in the United States that has battle flags. We've had we've had. Uh, we, we lost men uh, as, as, as midshipmen. We, were, we had two titles. We had cadets. We were cadets in the Merchantman Academy, and we were midshipmen in the Naval Reserve. So we had two ranks. We had, it was a dual rank in all cases. We were a cadet in the Merchant Marine, and we were midshipmen in the Naval Reserve. So we were Naval Reserve and Merchant Marine at the same time. And I have to explain what merchant marine means. Yes. Because merchant marine, in terms, is just a general term. That's that's a um, anywhere in the world, when somebody has a fleet, a nation has a fleet of ships, or ships that, are, well, they all sail under a certain flag. So um, when a ship is sailing, normally it's a ship that is ocean going. It's, it's considered part of the, the, com the nation's merchant marine. And it could be, they, a lot of them sail the Liberian flag, the Panamanian flag. But at our time, we had the largest merchant fleet, merchant marine fleet in the world. We had close to 10,000 ships under American flag. And then, in order to work the situation out in terms of handling wartime service, the United States government set up the War Shipping Administration and set up the Maritime Service. So it was expedient to leave these ships under um, house flags. So these flags were American President Lines, Likes Brothers. These were the companies that operated their ships normally during peacetime. But during wartime, they all agreed to be part of the War Shipping Administration and take their orders from the War Shipping Administration out of Washington. So it could be a coordinated effort. They didn't want one ship taken off and going to China, another ship going to the Mediterranean, another ship going here. They went wherever the, the United States government told them they had to go. So they had the War Shipping Administration, which administered all the ships at sea. And then they had the U.S. Maritime Commission, which was involved in training uh, seamen and also over, over, had oversight for the officer training program at the United States Military Academy, uh, Merchant Marine Academy. Now, the United States Merchant Marine Academy is a federal academy that has the same status as West Point or Annapolis, or as a matter of fact, it's, it was established prior to uh, the Air Force Academy. So there is the United States West Point Army Academy, 
Annapolis is the Naval Academy, Coast Guard Academy, and United States Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, Long Island, New York, and there's the Air Force uh, Academy in Colorado. So those are the five established service academies. Now, when we were cadet midshipmen at the academy, we also retained the rank of a midshipman as well. So we were midshipmen in the Naval Reserve, we were cadets in the Merchant Marine Academy at the same time. We had simultaneous commissions. And the same thing as when we graduated. When we graduated, we got commissions as ensign in the United States Maritime Service, and we got commissions as uh, ensign in the United States Naval Reserve. So we, we both got commissions simultaneously from both, both services. And we had a choice to go wherever we wanted to go. We could go into the Navy, we could go into the Merchant Marine. Uh, the role of the Merchant Marine is, is different than the Coast Guard or the Navy, right? You're, you're actually are the, are, you're, the role of the Merchant Marine, say, in the North Atlantic, how is that different from? The Merchant Marine, any, any ocean. Any ocean. Merchant Marine is simply a ship that is engaged in, in commerce for a particular service. The Merchant Marine is not a military operation. The Merchant Marines are civilians in, in maritime operations. But the thing is, is that many of the ships carried Naval Reserve status too. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so what? What they, if if a ship had a Naval Reserve status, they could make a phone call, and every 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 member of the ship's crew would automatically become a member of the uh, Navy simultaneously. I mean, so that was their re, that was their their um, position in case there was some particular problem that had to be done, taken care of right away. Also, on most of the ships, almost all the ships during World War II, they were armed. And, and the ships carried um, uh, usually 4-inch to 5-inch cannon on the stern and 3.5-inch cannon in the bow and 40 millimeter or 20 millimeter automatic cannons and machine guns. Now, sometimes the, those uh, armaments were manned by U.S. naval gun crews. They would come aboard separately. And they were really part of the crew, but they were usually under the command of, of a naval officer. But these, these ships, almost exclusively, all the ships that were running under American flag were armed with um, with heavy cannon and uh, and with uh, 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 automatic uh, anti-aircraft weapons, and we were trained in that. We when we went to we went to we went to basic training as midshipmen, we became um, uh, familiar with firing cannon, um, automatic weapons, machine guns. Was that in San Mateo or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that Southern California? Or? Yeah, so it's right outside of San Francisco. And we were, we all, we always took naval science classes. And with naval science classes, we also took, we were, we were given almost the same type of course that they were getting at Annapolis, but they were giving it to us in, a, in an expedited form in, uh, in, in San Mateo. Because we were told to get on board a ship within six weeks. So uh, one of the, one of the uh, one of the very very interesting uh, aspects of that is we we were under fire and under uh, in the North Atlantic and all over uh, while we were still cadet midshipmen. So we were the only academy that that has uh, that is in the war zone before they even get out of school. So, and we had one, one midshipman on O'Hare. Uh, actually, there was a ship, uh, the John Hopkins, was uh, fired on by a, a German raider. And a uh, German raider was very heavily armed. And most of the ship's crew from our, from our ship, our Liberty ship, was under fire, abandoned the ship. 
but this midshipman O'Hare um, uh, manned the five inch gun on the stern by himself and almost sank the German raider and ultimately was killed himself. But he so damaged the raider that the raider was caught by a, a British cruiser and sunk. But this one, one 18 year old kid stopped this huge German raider by manning this gun, which normally takes six or seven men to operate. Wow. And he... That was in the North Atlantic? North Atlantic. Yeah. Um, did you find... Did you, well, you were anxious to enter the service. Yes. Did you, did, so you didn't have any trouble adjusting to life in the service or... No, I... Discipline or no, training, thought, food, clothes, no, being away from home? I, I, I liked it all. <laughs> you liked it all? Yeah, I thought it was... I thought it was... Uh, I, 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 I felt that it was something that I wanted to do. And, I, and I, I wanted to get into the invasion of Germany and Normandy, but I just missed it because uh, I was on the train when I was getting, you know, the information of the capitulation of Germany. But I got into California and we were, we were planning the invasion of Japan. Yes, that's right. Yeah. This would have been the biggest armada in the world. Yeah. And we had 8,000 ships being readied on the West Coast. So every port that you went to, we would, if you could go into San Francisco and you could see the fleet there, you could almost walk across San Francisco to Oakland on the ships yeah. because they were just rafted up stern to stern and bow to bow and, and uh, yeah. port to port. We, we just had a program here at the library on uh, 65th anniversary of the Okinawa campaign. Uh -huh. And of course the whole point of Okinawa was to conquer the island and then use it as a staging point for the invasion of, uh, of Japan. And as you say, they, uh, they, Okinawa, the invasion began the 1st of April and it wasn't completed until June 23rd. So this period of May, June there, everybody is, is thinking it's probably going to be on to Japan. Well, the ship, the, yeah, well, yeah. well that, that's exactly what we thought. Yeah. And, and we were, uh, the ship that I was going to be sent on was scheduled to go to Okinawa. We were an ammunition ship. It was going to be sent to Okinawa. Well, do you remember the name of the ship? Or yeah, Petersburg Victory. Petersburg Victory. Yeah. And that, that ship was uh, laid up after the war. We didn't know the war was going to... We, we, we were all told this was, we were going to be part of the invasion fleet. And uh, we, I think just the... Mer if my memory serves me correct, just the merchant vessels alone was 8,000 ships, um, which is uh, enormous. I mean, if you think about it, you know. And most of them were, were all set to sail from, from West Coast ports. So the whole, the whole West Coast was being set up for the invasion. I mean, and we didn't know anything uh, until we all got word that uh, the, the atomic bomb had been dropped and that uh, uh, Japan had capitulated. That must have been quite a day, or, or were you disappointed, or celebrated, or... Well, we, it was just half and half. I, I myself was angry because I wanted to see the invasion. <laughs> I was prepared to go on the invasion. Oh, wow. Uh, but again, there was jubilation that we figured that a million men were going to be saved. Yeah. Because we, we, knew, that, we knew that the kamikazes were... Uh, we, we didn't have the complete word, but we knew that there was a huge kamikaze fleet that was... Uh, sheltered in the mountains and airfields in Japan that was set up so that they could try to obliterate this fleet that was coming towards them. So Jeff, Japan had stored fuel and, and ammunition and bombs yeah. and, and hid these kamikaze planes in anticipation of the invasion. So did you eventually set sail from? I set, I set sail from, from uh, San Pedro, California. And on the Petersburg, Petersburg victory. And you, your rank then was or your... Cadet midshipman. Cadet midshipman. Yeah. I, I, I spent six weeks in San Mateo and then I was sent, that was sent to the Petersburg victory. There was always two midshipmen for each ship. And um, I was sent to, to the ship and I couldn't find it. Couldn't find the <laughs> ship. And I found out that the ship didn't exist. So I found out it was in a shipyard being built. <laughs> so I, I had to go over and find some quarters over in, uh, in, in uh, Long Beach, California, until the ship was finally built. And then we set sail for uh, 
uh, in the South Pacific, and they they changed their orders, and then they sent us to the Panama Canal, and then they sent us up to Baltimore, and in Baltimore uh, the ship was declared uh, not necessary for um, any service, and it was to be mothballed, and uh, the Petersburg Victory never sailed to Japan, but it was mothballed. However, it was taken out of mothballs for the Korean War, and a very good friend of ours, Admiral King, was their captain, and he became the captain of the Petersburg Victory, and it, it was engaged in the, in the Korean War. And the, the Petersburg Victory, that was a Liberty ship or a destroyer? Or a, it was a Victory ship. A Victory ship. Yeah, there was a Liberty The Liberty ships were the original ships that were mass produced for the, for the war. And then right after that, they, they uh, built the Victory ship, which was a little faster and a little, uh, had different types of propulsion and whatnot. But they were, they were considered faster. See, we never, nobody ever knew the, the, the war. We, we figured the war in Japan was going to last another two years. We figured the invasion would, would last almost eight months, and then it would be another year and a half before you could subdue Japan. Um, and that was the general consensus of opinion at the time. So, so we were all preparing for that. And then um, when I got to New York, I reported to the Merchant Marine, to the uh, I, I reported to the academy, so I reported to, uh, we had an office on 90 Church Street, you know, with the rest of the Navy Department there, and uh, we, uh, I was told I was going to get another ship, and they, they sent me on the SS Examiner, and that ship was used to supply, to help supply the Marshall Plan for Europe, so I went from there to, um, um, uh, Italy, Turkey, uh, Lebanon, uh, uh, Spain, Alicante, Malaga, Marseille. This is on board the, the uh, SS, SS, SS exam. And your duties, your duty on the SS exam. Same, same thing. Cadet. Cadet. Yeah. So I was an in, in, in the engineering department. So I had to help with the engineering department, and I had to learn how to run the engines. And, and work all the equipment that aboard the exam. Back in high school, did you show any aptitude in any, any of those I like, subjects? I liked engineering a little bit. I yeah. always messed around with the cars. And I and, yeah. the cars, I went to the automobile shop, and I, I always had a car. I, I had a Model A Ford, and I had a, uh, you know, old junker cars that we cobbled together and made them run and things like that. Because so, yeah. um, you're. you're your your dad had come from Europe. Was that your first time in Europe across the Atlantic? Then, when you on the SS yeah. examiners, that must have been very interesting to oh, yeah. tie into that world. Uh, oh, yes, it was. Well, we, we we actually pulled into these um, ports right after the German army had left. So we got into Athens. The German army had left and and swept the entire city clean of food. So they, they took all the supplies with them, and so we, we gave the, the Greek population, you know, whatever food we could spare and things like that, and we also had some supplies from the Marshall Plan, so we, we gave them, you know, we had carnation canned milk, we had different supplies. Same thing for Italy and uh, other, other countries that we called them. And uh, so I made several, I made two trips to the Mediterranean. With we we went to uh, Spain. We were the f one of the first American ships to enter Spain after the end of World War II. Uh, we went to Marseille. Uh, then we went to uh, Piraeus, which is the port of Athens. Yeah. Then we went to Istanbul, Turkey, Smyrna, and uh, another couple of ports in Turkey. Then we went to uh, uh, um, Alexandria, Egypt, and uh, you know, all these legendary classical yeah. destinations. Yeah, we went through the entire Mediterranean. Yeah. So did you get any shore leave in any of these places? Yeah, 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 we had a lot of shore leave because those days the ships weren't container ships; they were um, what they call great bulk ships. They would have pallets, and they would just 
pile, you know, bags of rice or whatever on the pallets, and their, the ship's boom would pull it up and then just hoist the product and let, drop it down on the dock. And Steve had always had to handle it by hand. He had to load it from the hold onto the pallets, then it had to be picked up and then dropped on the dock and then unloaded again. Were you directly involved in those operations, or you no, were? That no, wasn't, that wasn't my yeah. area. The the other midshipman that was aboard the ship was a was a deck midshipman, and it, that was his his field of endeavor. My field was engineering, so I I occupied myself with the engineering. He occupied himself with running the ship at sea, you know, from the deck in the wheelhouse. And also, he involved in the loading and unloading of ships. Was the SS examiner was it uh, was it armed? Uh, no, they took all the all the uh, uh, they took all the guns off of them. Uh, when the war ended, they they removed the guns from the turrets were still there. The gun turrets were left, but they removed the guns and the ammunition because the rest the, the rest of the people on the ship they were paid by the company. They were paid by the company um, under the jurisdiction of the war shipping, shipping, war shipping administration. And you were paid from the U.S. government? No, direct, no. I, no. When I was a ship, when we were aboard a ship, we were paid by the war shipping administration too. So our salary, um, our salary was paid by the government while we were ashore, and we were paid by the war shipping administration while we were on board the ship. Um, the um, uh, the the um, the crew was, and you were paid just by voyage. In other words, in the merchant marine, you you only get paid for the for the voyage. So you sign up for the ship, and and they pay you from from the point you leave to the point you come back. So you're never paid for uh, clothing, or you're never paid for food ashore or transportation. You're only paid for the actual days you spend aboard the ship. Now, the SS examiner, if there were no war on, it might still be plying the seas, oh, right? Yeah. But it wouldn't necessarily have uh, a, mer a, a cadet ensign on board or a well, the war, yeah. wood. No, we, we kept that up. That, that tradition kept up. I mean, that, that went on beyond the war. So, in other words, to this day, there are cadet midshipmen that are aboard U.S. flagships that are sailing today. But we we we've fallen down from the, the most prominent merchant marine maritime nation in the world to somewhere around 140th. Uh, you know, so wow, we've we've gone down tremendously, and that's one of the things we've been working on. And, in other words, when this thing in Haiti came about, I thought to myself that maybe we could uh, reestablish a couple of these older ships. Like I got, I contacted Jeremiah O'Brien, which is in San Francisco, which is a Liberty ship, and the crew there volunteered to go to Haiti, and we were going to try to supply uh, rice from some of the rice farmers and donate the rice from uh, uh, California. Wow. And we were going to make that trip down there, but uh, their hull wasn't considered uh, seaworthy enough by the Coast Guard, and um, the shipyard wanted about a million bucks to, to uh, uh, weld some plates and things like that. And so that kind of, kind of got, I was in South Florida at the time, so I wasn't able to get in touch with the people that I knew. We were trying to, but you see, there, those ships could be unloaded in a port that's damaged. They're, they're made for that. You can pull into a port. You don't need a, you don't need these huge cranes to come up and pick up a, a container. Um, you, you just, the ship comes alongside. They have their own, they have their own cranes. Their cranes pick up these pallets and just dump them on anything. They can dump them on a, on a barge. They can jump them in a small boat. They can dump them on the dock. They can. Dump them, you know, so it's it's particularly valuable, I believe, for a place that has a um, earthquake, like in Chile and or in Haiti. The port facilities are destroyed. Port facilities are destroyed. You can immediately send these ships. So I called friends of mine in the Maritime Administration and, and tried to work with them to to get something going, and they got something working. They they got a um, 
they got a, a air uh, uh, air cushion ferry boat out of Hawaii or something that they you know I think it would have been uh, you know uh, if, if they had some ships that were in the ready reserve fleet they they, they mothballed these ships in like in San Francisco and different places in the United States keeping them in, in reserve but then they, there's a certain amount of cost in bringing them out of, out of the service you know. But, okay. No, um, the, um, were you able to stay in touch with your family while you were away? Not, not, no, no. no. Uh, we, only, we only were able to uh, uh, send mail through military. So whenever we were someplace, uh, the British Army would forward our mail or, or uh, we wouldn't get any mail, but we could send, you know, or, or the Army would the Army or Navy, if there was a base somewhere, we would we would send through the uh, Armed Forces uh, Post Office uh, letters home, but we rarely got home. Letters only, we only got our, our letters when we landed into a U.S. port. You know, and then we got our, so I was, you know, when I was at sea, I, I was out of touch with my family. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, and there was no communication. I obviously couldn't make phone calls or anything. I suspect in some of the more sophisticated ports that weren't damaged, because most of the ports were, were, were just torn apart. Like the uh, uh, Piraeus, uh, there wasn't a building that was left standing that was untouched. I mean, most every building was either the roof was blown off or the side was blown off. Or, um, and the British had bombed the city. And uh, there was a German torpedo uh, uh, depot there, and it fired off all the torpedoes, and it blew a hole in the ground about two, three blocks long, and a couple blocks wide, and 30 feet deep, or something like that. And killed everybody around there. It's almost like a kind of blast. The uh, the citizens of these different countries or ports must have been glad to see you. Oh, they? they loved us. I mean, we were just you know, heroes, you know. Uh, we weren't so welcome in the uh, in the uh, in the ports in uh, in Egypt. Uh, Egypt was under British control. Um, we weren't too welcome in Lebanon. It was under French, French control. control. Yeah. Um, we weren't too welcome in Istanbul, in Turkey. Either. But they were they just they loved us in Italy and uh, yeah. and, uh, and Greece. Spain was very happy to see us, but there I saw poverty worse than any uh, part of any part of the world that I've ever seen. Really? Yeah. What Franco had done was uh, he literally killed almost all the people on the other party. He killed the male members of the other party so that the women and children were left uh, without support. Any, yeah. any support. So they used to come to the ship every day to pick out our garbage and, and, and whatever food we could give them. Uh, you know. But we couldn't say anything about Franco because if you said anything about Franco, you would wind up in prison. And uh, that, that, that's another story that, yeah, sure, yeah. that needs to be told. But uh, not, so, not so much there, but in Russia, in the Romance Crown, um, if, uh, if any British or American sailor said anything about Stalin or, or, or brought some, some food ashore for a friend or anything like that, or magazine was worse than all, uh, they wound up in the salt mines in, in Russia. To this day, there's 5,000 men that are missing from, from the British and American forces that went there to help supply them. That was a terrible run, wasn't it? Fraught with danger. That terrible, terrible. Yeah. Thirty-two ships would start out, maybe eight or nine would come through, and then sometimes, uh, if you hit the water, you had 90, 90, 90 seconds to live. And in many cases, they 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 got into lifeboats, and when they found the lifeboats, they found all the sailors at their oars frozen stiff. They thought they 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 had saved somebody, and they pulled up to the lifeboat, and they were all sitting straight up, holding their oars, frozen. <laughs> you know, so, um, and then 
in many cases, when you finally got through to Murmansk, um, the, the Germans were attacking by air, by, you know, by submarine. And when we had our wounded, you know, brought ashore there, uh, the Russians would sometimes just nail the windows shut and nail the door shut and leave these people sitting there, you know. So uh, they were treated very poorly. Not in all cases, but in certain cases. Uh, when, when the war was, was in, in balance, they were, our, our people, our seamen were treated pretty well. I'm talking about British and American were treated fairly well when they got ashore. But when the war started, when it looked, when the Russians felt, or Stalin felt that the, he was on a, a move and, and the German army was, was being steadily pushed back, the conditions changed very much and, and they, they mistreated our people, you know, quite a bit. Yeah. They mistreated the British as well as the, uh, as the Americans. And uh, Churchill wrote, I read some of his memoirs, uh, Churchill's memoirs. He, he mailed to Stalin complaining about it. And Stalin wrote back and said, well, your men are, aren't, uh, aren't abiding by our local rules and regulations and things like that. You know? And he made no apology for it. So we still have men that are disappeared in a black hole over there. Yeah. So you made two trips across with the SS examiner right. and his Marshall Plan unfolding, and then right. then we went back to the academy and we finished up our, our, our schoolwork, and then our I was on I, I got in under the wartime program, which was a shortened program. Um, when I there, when the war ended, and, and incidentally they considered wartime service for the for the maritime. We, we were considered wartime uh, service up until December 1946, December 1st, 46. And one of the reasons for that is that we're still, we, we went through a lot of German minefields and, and uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, dangerous waters that, you know, we, we had some problems with. So it, we were considered uh, in war zones. Uh, you know, after after the war had uh, been uh, uh, delayed, but then we got back to the academy and we um, went through our regular we went through our regular courses. So the, all the regular courses kicked in. So instead, of, I was the first class that was was after the end of the war. So we had to stay on longer. It took us longer to get our commissions and our, our diplomas and everything. And then I got out of it, and I, I had played football for the academy, and I had damaged, uh, torn my uh, cruciate ligament in my knee and everything. So it was very difficult for me to serve on board a ship because of the uh, long ways to go down into the engine room. You had to go down five flights of stairs. So I joined the uh, submarine service. Uh, I noticed that submarine D. D-925, yeah. that's the submarine division we had here in Chicago. This was considered one of the best submarine divisions in the reserves. And uh, I didn't have to climb up and down, you know, everything was on a pretty much of a level platform. So when you graduated from, when you completed the training back at the academy, yeah. when you graduated from there you were a... I was a civilian. Civilian. Yeah, but I had commissions. I had a commission in the maritime service, so I could have gone aboard a ship and been a ship's officer. Also, I got an engineering license. I was an engineer, you know, so I could sail any ship in the ocean. And also, I, I was naval reserve. Naval reserve. I could have gone. But the, in 1948, they didn't, they didn't really want any, any uh, naval personnel. They were discharging, so the Navy was sort of quieting down. Yeah. So I, I went back into, uh, I, I became an insurance inspector and um, I joined up the submarine division in uh, Chicago here. We had a submarine here, uh, the SS Silversides. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So we trained aboard the Silversides. Then I went through the training program in London, Connecticut. And then every two weeks during the year, I would go to Norfolk, Virginia, or so this is in the Naval Reserve at this time, yeah. yeah. Right. So I would go to I would go to, to the 
for two weeks on a submarine, an active submarine. Well, how did you find how did you find being in a submarine is a whole different kind of psychology, isn't it? I mean, you're not necessarily. Well, not necessarily. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's you know tight quarters and cooped in. And it didn't, didn't bother me. I, I, I enjoy it. And, wow. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I, I like the submarines. Uh, the food was very good, you know. <laughs> And uh, we got extra pay. We got 50 percent uh, extra pay after wow. the school we paid. And um, uh, we, well, we were. I was all set to go to the Korean War, and they told us that anybody with submarine qualifications could not get into the regular line navy because they didn't want the. We had 268 submarines laid up all over the United States and Hawaii. We thought we were going to get into a war with China. So Even then? Yeah. Wow. So we, we thought the Korean War was going to spill off into China. I mean, we thought China would get involved in the yeah, Korean yeah. War. And then we, we, had, we didn't have enough surface vessels to, to combat, the, you know, to handle the, the coast of China. So we were going to, um, we were all assigned submarines to demobilize the submarines, get them over to the Chinese coast and, and and blew up all the shipping that were coming out of the uh, out of China. So, uh, all during the Korean War, we were told to stand by and just stay with our units. And, and you know, wherever we were, we had units in Chicago. And, and, uh, so you were you stayed on this assignment then in, in Chicago in during Chicago. this time. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we got the. As a matter of fact, I met Admiral Nimitz. Uh, we, I was the adjutant at that time, and uh, I took him around the. the uh, we had a we had an armor right on Lake Michigan. I don't know if it, it was torn down on the S curve on the on the drive was torn down. Oh, was that close to downtown? Yeah, it was downtown. Yeah, right in downtown. Where where the uh, 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 the Chicago Yacht Club is? That's we were right next to the Chicago Yacht Club. We had a pier that went out into the water, and we had the submarine. Yeah, I think I've seen a picture of it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and where's the Silver Sides now? Is it in a it's museum? In, uh, no, it's in no. Uh, um, up the lake somewhere? No, no, it's in um, Michigan somewhere. One of those towns in Michigan, I forget. Um, it's one of these small towns on, in, uh, in the, on the side of the lake, on the other side of the like lake. Like Muskegon or someplace? Yeah, or? I think it's Muskegon, yeah. Michigan. I yeah. think it's Muskegon. They made a museum out of it. Uh, what happened is Mayor Washington didn't want to spend the money to you know, keep it tied up because when the Navy decided they weren't going to use it. They tore down their armory. They had no place for it. So we moored it over on Navy Pier. And then Mayor Washington wanted to charge us rent for keeping it at Navy Pier. So we donated it to Muskegon. And then, incidentally, you know, this, I, after I got out of the submarines, I got into Naval Public Relations. And we were involved in getting the U-505 to the um, Museum of Science and Industry. So the U the U five oh five was the one the German U boat that was captured. Right, and it was in the East Coast port there, and uh, our our public relations unit got together and we um, got people interested in moving the uh, and Admiral uh, Gallery was part of our unit I think at the time, and he was the guy that was the kip, skipper of that aircraft carrier that captured the U five oh five. So he got involved, and we had a couple radio TV radio personalities in our program. So we we all got together and, and worked on getting that new 505 over to the Museum of Science and Industry. Then I, I just saw it recently again. They they uh, it's been a couple of years since I well they cut it in half originally and then slapped it up against the museum, and then one of our one of my very uh, not very good friends but a, a friend was Bruce Felkner, F-E-L-K-N-O-R, and he wrote some of the most definitive war articles about the Merchant Marine and the war. The, um, yeah. when, you, when you saw the, the, the German submarine up close, was it the was it same kind of design or the same construction as an American submarine, or different, or just older, or...? It was uh, a little smaller, and it had innovations that were very, um, that were very good. I mean, uh, like an American submarine, you see movies where the 
the, pair, the skipper goes around with the yeah. periscope like that. And the German submarine, the skipper sat on a chair and, a, and a, it was electric. And he, by, with the controls, he could, he could ride around the, the periscope on this little chair. So he didn't have to walk around like that. So, uh, and their, their optics were very good. And their torpedoes were different than ours. Ours were steam-driven turbines. The alcohol was fired off, and then alcohol derivative was, was made steam and, and run. Their torpedoes were all electric. They were all battery-operated. An interesting thing also is the U-505 crew was, uh, was sequestered in Georgia. And they were told that they uh, could not, they could not um, uh, communicate with their relatives or with the International Red Cross because we had captured their code books and things like that. So we were able to crack their, their codes. So they were kept in communicado. And after the war, they were told that because of that, they, they would all be granted automatic American citizenship. So about 50% of the U-505 crew automatically became U.S. citizens and are here today. And they come down to the museum every once in a while, and they, uh, they, they are helpful in bringing pictures and articles and, and uh, information about the ship and how they operated and what they did. So it's very, very authentic. I mean, that is the most authentic, one of the most authentic displays I've seen of the merchant marine and the, uh, and the submarines. Uh, so the, the uh, and the Museum of Science and Industry is very happy to have the U-boat there and there's no, oh, yeah. there's not going to, there's well, no question about maintaining it or anything else. No, no. it's beautiful. Yeah. We, we, we originally, we cut it in half and we took half of it and put up against the wall and cut a hole in the wall and then made an exhibit that way so you could see, you could come in through the museum and see the inner workings. Well, just recently, and I had nothing to do with it or I didn't know about it even, why I knew roughly about it. They took the submarine and welded it back together. And it's a complete submarine now. And it's housed in a huge hall all by itself. And it's up on, it's up on blocks. So you can actually go through the submarine in, in, in its entirety, in its totality. And it's all fixed up. It's all the machine guns and everything that are, are, are put together. So, so we, the, Na the Naval Reserve then, for how many years were you at sea then, in, 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 for two weeks or whatever, was it every summer? Well, I, every summer. Every summer you would go somewhere. Yeah, every summer I'd go somewhere. And then, then when I got too old for that, they, I, I joined the public, Naval Public Relations Unit. And then I just kept my reserve status, and then I had to give my reserve status up in 1967. And then and that final rank was? Uh, lieutenant. Lieutenant. The German minefields that you had to sweep, were those in We didn't sweep. We, we had to go through them. Go through them. That was in... Uh, in the Adriatic. In the Adriatic. The GFC. Yeah. 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 So when you... Um, there's a couple of questions you always ask as we yeah. get toward the end. And yeah. I, I switch this. Actually, I still didn't explain the merchant marine. Yeah, well, I'll give you a chance to... No, I understand yeah. that. Yeah. I don't want to get... It's, it's so easy to digress from this. So. Well, it's all fascinating. You've... Uh, I'm enjoying this very much. Thank you. Um, how do you think your uh, How do you think your military service affected your life? Well, it uh, it disrupted it. I mean, in other words, uh, there were things that uh, that I uh, 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 would have done differently. However, um, had I not been hurt playing football, I would have uh, I would have. Uh, Stayed with the Merchant Marine for uh, uh, a number of years because there was uh, a, an opportunity there. What position were you playing? Uh, I was playing left guard. Left guard. And uh, we were uh, we were playing a uh, a very tough schedule. We played Boston College. We played Villanova. We played, and we were all just 17, 18 year old kids. And we also had always lost a year at sea, so we were never we were never uh, uh, a, a complete team as such. And yet we were playing against veterans from all the wars and everything at all these big colleges. So we were outclassed in many ways, you know. 
and, and then uh, a lot of kids left and were recruited by different colleges. Yeah. Does your knee still pain you at times? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I really should get another one, but I, I, uh, I, uh, I knew me, I should uh, get a knee replaced. So if you had stayed with the, the Merchant Marine, mm -hmm. um, that would have been for uh, five years, ten years. Oh, about five, six years. Five, something six years. Like that. And during that time, how much of the time, how much of the year would you be at sea around these those, voyages? Those voyages, you stayed, you just stayed there. You know, you you, you stayed at sea mm -hmm. until you decided to get an off the sea. You know, I mean, in other words, you could you could decide to make a voyage. Those days, you could make a voyage, and then. Uh, go home if you wanted to, and then come back and make another voyage. Yeah. Or you could split it up that way, or you could stay at sea continuously. It was up to you. Today, most of the merchants, the, the we have such a small fleet now, but most of them are container ships now, so they don't spend any time in port. So a, a lot of the crew members, uh, most, the officers, I don't know about the crew so much, but they have, uh, like, if, if they're employed, they're employed more or less by the companies, the tankers and things like that. Yeah. And they would stay, like, for example, uh, um, three months on and one month off. Or they would, they would take four months on and a month off. So they're, because they don't, they don't get any breaks. When they get at the port, they're out in 24 hours. So. It's, it's really continuously at sea, so they break it up. So you, you have like nine months on and, and three months off or something like that. So in, um, so is it like Chicago, you're back in Chicago in a civilian capacity like in 1949 or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And did you have any trouble adjusting to civilian life? Or no, no. Able to get a job pretty easily, or uh, jobs were relatively difficult to get. Still difficult, yeah. They were difficult to get, and I worked as a uh, as a as a border inspector and and, and inspected. Uh, I, I worked for an insurance company, and we inspected uh, buildings, like you know, hospitals. And yes. Uh, matter of fact, one of my accounts was Notre Dame. I had to go to Notre Dame and inspect the boilers and the machines. High school or college? college. University? Oh, yeah. No, uh, the, the university. Yeah. I, mean, uh, uh, I just have to remember it because somebody else was telling me it was in Notre Dame at that time. And, but, uh, and then I decided I wanted to get a, a master's degree in business administration. So I went in. To the University of Chicago. Yeah. And uh, then I got my master's degree there. And uh, then I. Um, uh, went to work for a bank for 20 years, and then I started a couple of my own companies. I had a, I had three plastics companies, and I had a, a transformer company out here in, in Elmhurst, uh, Bensonville. And then um, I retired in 1986. The, I'm, I think you have written here in the Industrial War College, U.S. Industrial War College. Yeah. I used to take correspondence courses with the Navy, Navy War Industrial College. So in case of mobilization, they they wanted people to call on us to get the um, um, the production going, and then it, it, our our whole shipping industry just died. I mean, we don't build ships. I mean, the only thing that, that we built recently is the uh, gambling boats, you know, and. Uh, aircraft carriers and things like that. And, uh, a lot of my classmates uh, became um, uh, submarine. They worked for General Dynamics. And they were one of my classmates, uh, uh, Maladosian's classmate, was uh, uh, chief engineer for General Dynamics, building submarines in, in uh, New London. And uh, so, uh, but I, uh, I was also given a chance to. Start a couple of shipping companies, you know. That, uh, yeah, that that sounds like it might be. Uh, yeah, it was very interesting. To yeah, me. and uh, we uh, we were giving uh, uh, ships were being sold from our fleets all over the world, so we don't have hardly any ships on the American flag anymore. Yeah. It, it's it's more expensive to run an American ship because we have Coast Guard regulations and we have. Regulations for the crew, for their comfort and their safety, and lifeboats and things like that. Where the other countries don't have that, 
You met uh, Admiral Nimitz. Did he? Yep. Did he impress you, or did yeah. he have a? Did he have it as? I mean, he was a leader. Very, or? very small, quiet fellow. Not, not, not given to very expansive uh, 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 attitude at all. He, very modest, you know. And uh, he was a submariner too. He was one of the first submariners, you know. Yeah. And uh, he yeah, very, very quiet. We had dinner together. To be a submariner, you don't have to be a certain size. You can't be too big. You can't be too big. No size, but no they would take a left guard, though. They, they would take a left guard. You yeah, yeah, left, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they would. Yeah, they they didn't want anybody too big or too bulky or too heavy or. Uh, first of all, you you, you spent uh, two weeks um, um, in um, intensive um, uh, physical exams. In other words, they uh, they um, they uh, put you through these. Uh, they don't do it anymore; it's too dangerous. But they had these towers that were 100 feet high, and it was filled with water. So you entered the bottom of this tank, and you got into a little tube, and you um, uh, locked the door, and the tube started filling up with water. And then you had to take a breath of, of air, compressed air, and then uh, let the water in from the from the top, and then you float it out, and then you there's a steel wire that went up to the top, and you had to hold your breath for four minutes because it took you four minutes to get to the top. Four minutes. Four minutes, but you could do it because the air you took on at the bottom was compressed. Oh. So you had to go up just the right speed. <coughs> so you had to go up. You can't. You can't go up faster than your than your uh, bubbles. Because if you look down, and the bubbles are down there. You would you would be going up too fast, and you would you would expand your lungs and burst your lungs. And if you went up uh, too slow, then you would run out of breath. You know. So you had to keep just the right speed. You know, and they, they, as they say, they spent two weeks testing you. I mean, and giving you a physical exam yeah. and hearing. And uh, I've always wondered if they give psychological exams. Oh, yeah, sure. Because you're in that space. I was oh, just sure. wondering. First psychological exam they give you. Uh, that's they. As soon as you get there, it's the first day. They, they, they have a steel chamber. It's about. Uh, 12 feet in diameter or something like that. And they're just iron seats, uh, metal seats on both sides. you got to get completely undressed. And everybody, no, you're, there's no rank there. If you go through submarine school, there's no rank. If you can be an admiral, you can be a captain, you can be an ensign. You know, I talk about the officers, I don't know about the listed men necessarily. Cause, but they might have had the same thing, I don't know. But you would go into this tank, maybe 40, 50 people, you know, and they would put up pressure on the tank. They would turn up the pressure. Pressure get hotter and hotter and tougher and tougher. Pretty soon your eyes felt like they were being pushed in and your eardrums were being pushed in and your chest was being pushed in and you couldn't breathe. And it was hot and, and guys would pass out and they would, they, would, they would look through the porthole and they would run out and pull you out. <laughs> and, and then they knocked out 40, 50 they, they knocked 40, 50 percent of the people the first the first hour by this hyperbaric pressure chamber, you know, that they that they used, and uh, they had all kinds of things like that. Now, after you went up this this tower, they told you that you have to put your left hand up and your left foot on, and then you take your and if you if you grab the rail with your right hand instead of your left hand, it was it disqualified you for it, you know. Wow, and uh, they had all kinds of a bunch of different tests, and they, um, um, they you you were pretty well. Let's, let's put it this way: you you they would weed out 80, 90 percent of anybody who would have a problem with a submarine, you know, yeah. because what they what they were doing with that escape chamber, they they don't do it anymore because you can't escape from more than 100 feet from a submarine. I mean, Possibility, but there were chambers, and we could do that. We would put a submarine down 100 feet down 
you know, Norfolk or something. The guy would get in the escape chamber and fill it up, take a breath of air, and, and go up the uh, up, go up to the surface. And he could escape that way. But you know, the water was very cold, and you know, 100, 100 feet in the Atlantic Ocean, you know, it's pretty cold. You know? Yeah, you have to want to do that. Yeah, right. So they had all these all these different and. They, they also had a complete uh, submarine, like a submarine, built under a huge dome. And you could practice making the submarine go up or down as a simulator, but long before we ever had those simulators. And they had huge granite polished uh, uh, duplication of the ocean up on top. So when you looked up in the periscope, you could see the exact same horizon that you would see on a ship. And then they had little tiny ships that went around. And then you would have to work your torpedo data processing and all that so that you could, you could know, learn how to fly a torpedo. The, um, when you retired and, and maybe had more time, do you feel like you want to get out on the sea again or go for cruises? Oh yeah, that? sure. I love it. Yeah. I would go, my, my wife is not too, you know, she, she is a difficult traveler, she is, you know, she loves it, but she, it's difficult for her to travel for many reasons, yeah. so we don't travel that much. We, we've made a number of cruises to South, you know, on, on the Caribbean, the, yeah. the normal trips, the Panama Canal, because uh, I went through the Panama Canal in 1945, and I went down there about 10 years ago. And everything is exactly the same. I mean, the same engines, the same equipment, the same gates, the same power. The only thing different is they have the lampposts. They have huge lights, and the lights are on swivels, so an aircraft carrier can get through, get through, it. Get through there. But other than that, it is, it's in the time warp. It's, it's so when you, when you go aboard your ship, do you say, I need to see the engine room? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get on the engine room. I, get on, I, like, I like to go on the bridge because uh, years ago we, we established a, uh, a group of guys from Kings Point and, and different people that went to sea. We, uh, we got a hold of a Navy, um, it's still today, it's operating today, um, uh, a, um, a, 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 Navy, a small Navy ship, it's 84 feet long. And we operate it to, to this day. Uh, we train Sea Scouts and, uh, and uh, naval midshipmen from Notre Dame and Northwestern and things like that. And it's all ex guys like myself that are running this ship. And we we pay so much a month to to, to be members, and then we we get some money from the Navy League and some money from different places. And matter of fact, we even train midshipmen from um, we trained. Uh, uh, recruits from Great Lakes Naval Station. They don't have a boat up there. <laughs> and your boat is, is uh, right out here in Rose Street. Oh, that's yours. Yeah, yeah. the Monatra. The Monatra. Yeah, it's a. Uh, and we made a movie out of that once too, with the Jackal. It was used in the film The Jackal. Yeah, it was used in the film The Jackal. That's a Frederick Forsyth novel, right? With uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, you say the American Merchant Marine is much smaller these days than it was. Yes. Um, but is the but there's still an important need for, oh, the, the, for the academy, academy and its well, future is the, safe. Well, the, the academy is is morphed, and that's what we've been working on. Uh, first of all, the academy is probably one of the finest. Uh, office of training programs in the country today. Um, our graduates now uh, graduate into all kinds of things. Um, as a matter of fact, right now, I just had reason to call down in Houston. One of our graduates is one of the top astronauts in the country, Captain Kelly. You know, he's a Navy a captain. And um, uh, he's in training now. You can't talk to him when, they, when they're in training. But we have um, astronauts, we have uh, uh, naval officers, we have uh, uh, Marine Corps officers, we have uh, um, uh, you know, the, the requirements now is that you have to put in five years of federal service. So you have to be, you can join the FBI, you can join the uh, 
CIA, you can join the uh, Marine Corps, Air Corps. We have uh, 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 Malagosian and I, uh, one of our classmates uh, who just passed away, Rick Alvarado, was commander of uh, Air Force, wing commander of Air Force One. He was, he was uh, flying uh, Jack Kennedy all over. He was the last guy to see Kennedy alive um, in Dallas. And so we've got, uh, it, uh, it's open to all the services. And you can, as I say, pick out government service. State Department is another one. Um, CIA, Secret Service. So you're required to put the five years in service in, which I think is a good idea because it gives them, uh, but you have the flexibility of service. Service, yeah. Which but, you're, but when you're at the, the uh, academy, it's, it's maritime. The maritime is degree. What, you're, what you're learning, but you're learning military. You're, you're learning principles mil and military yeah, skills degree. at the yeah. same time. You're going yeah. to naval science. When we graduated, you could only go into the Navy. I mean, you know, um, also, we have people going into Army Corps of Engineers, too, you know, so. Um, but now it's, it's morphed into more of a, of a training program for officers uh, of all kinds. And what we'd like to do, we also have a graduate school that teaches uh, intermodal transportation. That's containers, um, uh, container ships, uh, transportation. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, admiral that was in charge of it, uh, we had a, a disruption in this last election, so he got switched over to the Maritime Administration. And our superintendent, who was a lieutenant general in the Marine Corps, became an admiral in the Maritime Service. Um, he, w he resigned, and uh, I was hoping that he could get back because we lost a lot of good men there in the chain. But I, we're right, our, our academy is located right on um, Kings Point, Long Island. So you can see Manhattan from, from the harbor there. And we have, um, you know, we, we have all kinds of things. Uh, we had the uh, America Cup racer. Um, uh, the guy from CNN, Ted Turner, was a skipper. He won the cup for for the academy, <laughs> and uh, uh, we have uh, huge uh, resources for for yachting and for for you know uh, racing, you know, and things like that. When I was there, we had uh, Barbara Hutton had uh, donated her yacht. It was the largest sailing school in the world. We sailed it down to Buenos Aires, and we we uh, wow. we uh, we had it as a very uh, goodwill ambassador type of thing. You would, you would have crossed the equator then, right? Yeah. Was, did you have a celebration when you crossed the equator? I, I didn't go oh. because oh. I was playing football. Oh, but, you were tearing up your... But, yeah. but our, uh, our, our guys went, went there. Yeah, yeah, they had a celebration crossing the equator. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, incidentally, when, when I was with our neighbors in public relations unit, we had a, uh, we had a plane over in Glenview, uh, Naval Air Station. I don't know if you remember that or not. Vaguely, yeah. yeah we used to have, uh, now it's, it's called the Glen. Right, right, yeah. But that was a, a naval air station yes. at the time. And uh, every year we used to take a couple planes and fly all around the world. We'd fly to London and then to Paris and then, to, and then meet with all the consular officials. And, the, and we, have, we, have, we have guys in the State Department and all different, you know, parts of the world. You yeah. know? So it's expanded. Now, I would like to see us expand. We have we have some we have some more space there now. I mean, we've got extra barracks. Well, during wartime, during wartime, we 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 actually sort of it was essential to save the country because if if England went down, uh, you know, Russia would have gone down. Russia would have gone down. We would have been. Very, very, very difficult to fight um, uh, and enhance Germany and, and Japan. I mean, we would have been squeezed from both sides. So the fact that we were able to bring supplies to, Ru to Russia and supplies to England at that critical time was 
that was the most important thing at the, at the time. And, and that, that's when you read the book. You book, know, yeah. It will it'll bring out that aspect of it. Yeah. Mr. Browski has yeah. uh, left us uh, a book entitled uh, The Men in the Ships of the Warriors, 1942 to 1945, Drawings and Texts by Lawrence S. McCready. And you right. knew Mr. McCready. He was my engineering, uh, uh, head of our engineering department. And uh, he helped me and, uh, and Charlie graduate because we were both injured. And uh, they wanted to, to discharge us. And he got us a, a waiver so that we could graduate. Was Charles up? Uh, yeah. He played football also? No, no. Oh. He was hurt with something else. Oh. We were in the same hospital. Together. <laughs> That's how we got the three really good buddies. We were at the uh, St. Albans Naval Hospital. I was there for my knee, and he had some exotic disease. Is that in New York, St. Albans? Yeah. 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 And, and inside Kings Point is, is right, not too far from LaGuardia Airport. It's Walter Price's old estate, which, which is described there in the book. Yeah. The, um, how do you think your, your association with the Merchant Marine in the U.S. Navy and uh, World War II and events and awareness of Korea, um, how do you think it's affected your view of the war? Well, uh, my, my personal feeling is that uh, there's no point in fighting a war unless it's absolutely essential, it's forced upon you. you know. Um, I, I think these were war. These these were wars of choice. Now, you know, I'm sure that people, a lot of people, wouldn't agree with that. But I, I don't think this was. Uh, we we had a pure war. <laughs> we know what we were doing. We know where the enemy was. It was kill or be killed. I mean, if we didn't win this war, that last war, though, we would be sitting here talking. I, I, that's my personal feeling. And I think that uh, th these wars here now are, are I, I don't know, maybe there's some reason for it, maybe there isn't, but I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't quite see it, yeah. possibly because the wars, I, I'm not even sure that I think that the Korean War was all that terribly essential either, nor the Vietnam War. You know, I, mean, I, I think that uh, these, were, these were wars of choice again. Same with Granada. Same with uh, the invasion of Panama. You know, I mean, what was the, what was the, what was the uh, actual? Maybe there was something I don't know about. But uh, I think uh, now I think we're we're in asymmetric warfare. So we don't have masses of ships. We don't have masses of. Uh, I mean, you can take the most powerful. The only the only thing really stopping us right now from being annihilated probably are submarines and the, the, you know, the nuclear submarines I think were, the, were our safety factor since World War II. And, um, but uh, I think that, which is way beyond me, I, I worry more about asymmetric warfare, nuclear warfare, and cyber warfare. I, mean, I think those, those, were the, those are the battlefields now as opposed to these huge, but I do think that it's very important that the merchant marine do not, is not left alone because your best example was this uh, uh, Icelandic volcano going off. Now, if, if your planes are grounded for any length of time, the only way you're ever going to keep everybody alive is, is with a maritime fleet. And no great maritime, no great nation has ever survived without a maritime, a strong maritime presence. And I, even though it may cost us a little bit more to run a ship, even if we got a little more safety regulations on a ship, so what? We don't want to race to the bottom. We, and it doesn't cost that much more to run a ship. I mean, these, these ships are almost run by computers anyhow. So um, I, I've been pushing for a long time to try to rebuild our merchant fleet. And uh, I've been talking to people in the Maritime Administration. I've been talking to my congresswoman. I've been talking to uh, people in Washington. And, uh, that would be a, a government uh, sponsored program to provide incentives for American companies to right, get yeah, back into right, the, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, one, the one thing we could do right immediately is 
make it, make it mandatory that any military supplies are, are carried Trans by American, American ships. ships. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that's simple. I mean, why, first of all, it's a recline. It, it, it's a safety regulation. I guarantee you, if, if we have, like in the uh, Gulf War, things like that, we had to pay huge amounts of fees to foreign ships to bring our, our uh, tanks and our equipment and all that to the, to the battlefront. We paid more than, more than we would ever cost us by maintaining a merchant fleet. So we should keep a, a strong maritime presence. And I think it ought to be somewhat similar pattern after World War II, where there ought to be some auspices like a shipping administration that has some control over the ships so that if, it, if we need ships to go into a dangerous situation, they would have to go in some way or another. We would, we would change that ship into a, a military ship and order it into it. So if we have dangerous waters, uh, they have to go in. You know, that, so we had to. There was, there was no question about it. We never thought about it. I mean, if somebody told us we had to go to Romance, that was it. We didn't think twice about it, you know, even though we knew that most of the ships wouldn't get through. And the same with any place else. If they told us to go through a minefield, <laughs> we just put out a, a, a life jacket and slept on deck, you know. <laughs> so, there was, there was nobody thought to say, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and today, if you try to send a, a foreign merchant ship somewhere like that, they're going to either... Oh, yeah, wait, wait, yeah. And yeah. drive it crazy. And I talked to these fellows that have sailed through the, um, through the pirate wars. I was just going to ask you that, yeah. Oh, I've spent a lot of time with them. I said, you know, oh my God. Uh, I, I talked to a number of skippers that are sailing, you know, that the, are... The co cat their their uh, um, their um, uh, on the same sh ship line, Maris ship line that, that this captain and um, Phyllis was, you know. And he, they said their their protocol now is to round the crew up and, and lock them up in the engine room, and then for the captain to run into a, a room and get on a satellite phone and, and lock himself in there, you know. I mean. But in our day, we were all trained to. And fire 20 millimeters and third 40 millimeters. Nobody would get near us. I mean, if, if, if a pirate tried to gap on a line on there, my God, we would have. You'd be blown the kingdom come. Oh my God, we would have blown them out of. If they stuck their head above the rail, <laughs> there wouldn't be any head there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, uh, I don't understand it. Uh, and I've talked to, I've talked to our you know, military personnel. They're, 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 they've got some. Some of the ships, first of all, under the maritime laws of different countries, they don't like weapons aboard ships. Yeah. So when you get into harbors, they're, 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 they, don't want, they want you to check your weapons and this and that. And that. But I, I'm sure that there's, you could go to the United Nations, which they're doing now, and, and getting certain protocol. Because now they can't, even, they can't even arrest these guys. They kept the pirates and they know how to do it. Yeah, where they found yeah, yeah, where they found them. They them back to Kenya or someplace like that. You yeah. know, I mean, years ago, you know, there was no such thing as a pirate. You know, I mean, he was dead. You know, he threw him overboard. You know, we would have thought twice about it. He saw a pirate. And I could take him to court in Kenya. <laughs> he, he would be feeding the fishes, you know. <laughs> But, uh, Mr. Rodney, this has been a very uh, informative and, and comprehensive um, uh, interview. And as, as we move a little bit toward the end, we always ask, is there anything you would like to have, you can think of that you'd like to talk about that we haven't perhaps covered in, in some Yeah, I, I don't think, I, I've just, I've, I've digressed quite a bit. But I, what I wanted to bring out in many ways is that we, the merchant marine personnel of World War II was very unfairly treated. Uh, not so much myself, but uh, guys who went uh, signed up to go on these trips to Murmansk or signed up to the North Atlantic and things like that, and they were shot up. They were never they were never compensated. They were never given any medical care. They were, it was all just GI, no GI Bill. No GI Bill of Rights, nothing. We got, in 1988, we got 
um, approval to declare us veterans. So we are considered veterans. Um, I get um, pharmaceuticals from the VA. You know, I had to apply for it, of course. Uh, we get death benefits. I mean, in other words, a couple hundred dollars if you're buried. In, or you could get buried in a veteran's cemetery. You get a flag. Um, but um, there was no GI Bill of Rights. Uh, these people were, matter of fact, their bodies weren't even shipped back. I mean, the families had to, had to pay for their bodies to be shipped back if they were killed somewhere. Or, or, uh, uh, most of them were lost at sea, so it didn't make too much difference. We also served, we had more casualties than any other service. There were more people killed than any other service. Wow. So, um, the Marine Corps was the only service that surpassed us in one year when they had these invasions in Tarawa and Guadalcanal and things like that. But proportionally, of the number of personnel that were involved, we had more deaths than any other service. And they had to pay for their own clothes. They had to pay for their own equipment. They had to pay for their own uh, transportation. So they only got paid from the day the ship took off to the day that the, the ship, you know, got back to port, and anything else, they were they were isolated. So the, the fact that they made a few dollars extra for being in a war zone, you know, the, there was a, a big rumor that they were making tons of money. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah. yeah. They, they were, for example, uh, a seaman first class in the in the navy would be getting maybe fifty, sixty dollars a month or something like that. Uh, but he got everything. He had no expenses other than that. Um, they had their, covered their own expenses, and they might have gotten $125 a month. So the disparity was, you know, not, and it had nothing to do with the GI Bill of Rights. I mean, forgetting about the GI Bill, but just the day-to-day -day living expenses. The it was very comparable. I mean, by the time you took off the cost of all these other things that you had to do, and you had you had to transport yourself. If you went home or something like that, you had your own expenses. You had your own expenses coming back. You had to buy your own clothes. If you lost your clothes, and once you were torpedoed, you were, your, your pay stopped. The ship was sunk, your pay stopped. <laughs> if you were captured by the Japanese or the Germans, your pay stopped. Uh, I met a number of seamen that, that were in Japanese prisoners of war camp for three years. They came out penniless. They had nothing. They had no money. They had, they had no money to even go home. I, I left a couple of them lying in the gutter in San Pedro, dead drunk. They didn't have money to, to do anything. I mean, they were, they were brought home. They were heroes. There was a parade. They were 20 years old. Their hair was white. <laughs> and they, some of them were on the, on the Bridge River. You know, they were on the Bridge River Quiet. They were, they were brought Prisoners of war, they were told to build that bridge that somewhere that they, they had over there. And they were survivors of that. You know, so, um, uh, you know, King's Point was a little bit different because basically, if we got hurt, like I got hurt playing football, I, I, they sent me to a naval hospital because I was in the naval reserve. You know, but the merchant marine, they, they had what they called marine hospitals, but they were very, very few and far between, and certainly were, there was maybe just a couple of them in the whole United States, yeah. and there was no transportation, and, uh, and the care was very poor, you know, it was sort of like for indigents almost. So I feel that, and, and we have a bill in Congress now, House, House Bill uh, number 63, no, House Resolution 23 is a bill to correct that, and we have Senate Bill, um, I think it's Senate Bill, I think it's Senate Bill 663, and it's being held up by Senator Okaka in, the, in, uh, in Hawaii. He's chairman of the uh, Veterans Committee. And for some reason, he just won't uh, won't let that bill. It's been approved by unanimously by the House of Representatives, and it's, it's being held up in, in the Senate. So, uh, 
those are things that I, you know, we've been working on. Yeah. I've been working on that for six years, you know. But, uh, 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 When's he up for re-election? Well, he, he'll never get kicked out because oh. he's, he, has, he has a Asian community that uh, supports him in Hawaii. Uh, Senator Inouye, who's, who's, who's he here? he's what? for us. He's a word. Hero. He's a warrior. He's yeah. for us. Yeah. I talked to his nephew and everything. Senator Inouye is really for us. Senator Okaka. He, he says he's not against us, but he's not for us. He won't rule on out of committee. So he wants us to put it in as an earmark somewhere. You know. Oh. But, uh, uh, all he has to do is let it out of the committee. We've got enough senators to pass it, too. We've got, we've got enough senators that are that are co-sponsors that would, uh, would pass. And this bill would accord benefits and recognition yeah, to Yeah, that, that, that would give $1,000 a month to all surviving uh, seamen that uh, uh, served before December 1st, 1946. It can't be, and that, that's a dwindling. Every day we lose 150, every month we lose 150 men. And uh, we've got about 10,000 survivors about 3,000, 4,000 would get their documentation together to show what they, where they went. You know, they lose the stuff. You know, yeah. So you have to be very well documented where you were and everything yeah. else. And uh, they, you have to have your Z papers, you know, with document. I might have locked up in my... When you say Z, that's not your discharge. Your no, no. It's a, Z papers were showed you when, you when you sailed aboard ships. And you had a Z number. You know, the virtually had a Z number. No. So that, and the captain would sign it off for the yeah. voyage. The, the, I was just wondering if you could touch on a, on a topic sure, that you raised before we turned yeah, on sure, the recorders sure. here. You were saying about a group of far-sighted individuals, was it in the 30s, that thought there might, that anticipated right. yes. a need for the... So those four, yeah. four, they, and they, they helped form the academy. They, 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 they set up, they bought the estate there in New York, and they set up the training programs. And they went around and they they begged, borrowed, and stole. Were they money. former military men or no, academics? Most, or most, or most, or most, or most of them were uh, uh, merchant marine and navy. And uh, it's explained some of them. In there, the book, yeah. In the book, and some of the key characters, Admiral Stedman being one of them, and and Lawrence McCready, the admiral there, was he he would go around and find you know boilers and stuff like that that nobody was using and bring it in there and and use it for, our boilers were used to train people and also to heat the academy. <laughs> you know? yeah. And we, we had museums, I had one of my, one of my classmates, not a classmate, it was an alumni, uh, Babson, we, we donated oh, hundreds of millions of dollars to set up a museum, we have a very significant museum out there. Yeah. Uh, you were saying that, the, the, these, um, men who were blessed with some foresight, they, they foresaw some kind of a, a future conflict. Yeah, they, they foresaw World War II. And a need for uh, an organization of to control the shipping. To control the shipping. Yeah, because if, it, if you let every ship go helter-skelter, and you know, they, they, they saw what happened in World War I, and then they decided that they would not let that happen again. And they would, they're the ones that started the Maritime Commission the ones that started the War Shipping Administration and, and put together it all. Between the Navy and the, and the Maritime Service, these people put this whole package together. And one of the keystones of this package was the Merchantman Academy, which is where they taught people and everything. And, and Roosevelt was very much aware of this. Uh, President Ro the, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Had he been Secretary of the Navy? Or, uh, yeah, he was yeah. Secretary of World yeah. War One. And his wife was a very big supporter of, um, um, I forget her name. Uh, Eleanor? Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt was a, was a regular visitor to the academy. Uh, she used to come out quite frequently and, and spend a lot of time with us, you know. Uh, not with me so much as a midshipman, but with the officers. And she was very interested how the academy ran and, and was helpful in getting funds and things like that. So. Uh, we owe her a debt of gratitude. You know, she was a big supporter of the Merchant Marine. You know. And so was Franklin Roosevelt. Had he lived, we would have had the G.I. Bill of Rights and everything. But uh, he, he passed away before that. You know. And 
there was about 260,000 men involved in, in the merchant marine during World War you know, that were at, at sea, you know, and uh, we had a huge percentage of casualties, you know, especially in the North Atlantic, they, they were, yeah. uh, ships were being sunk, you know, and there was no, they, you couldn't pick them up. I mean, in other words, if you had a destroyer, they weren't going to stop to, to pick up uh, survivors or anything like that. They just took off. You know. So, and any any injury you had, matter of fact, any time I injured myself or something like that, uh, I got hurt or cut or, or, or burned or something, I would go to the British Army or someplace to, to get some medical attention. There was no medical attention aboard the ship. You know, the, the most medical attention you had was uh, aspirin. The purser had a bottle of aspirin and maybe some alcohol. You got burnt from steam in the engines or something? Pipes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pipes, yeah. Yeah, so you couldn't, you know, wait until you got to shore. Most, most, most of the places where we went to, that I went to, for medical attention was the British Army. They didn't have to, but I would go in there and say, hey, I got a cut or a burn or something like that, and they would take care of it for me. So, so the English were helpful in it. Yeah, they were. Well, they knew that, they knew that they're survival. <laughs> <laughs> they knew what kind their bed was buttered on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of, of all the things that they had, had, a work, had a develop, the, the fact that saved them was, was the fact that these ships came in there at the at, yeah. at, at that yeah. time, the crucial time. You know. yeah. But well, it's an interesting story. Mr. Brodsky, I, I, you, thank you for such a generous, wide-ranging interview. And um, you know, you could have wound up being a lecturer at one of your instructor at a at a war college. I mean. You, you, <laughs> Such a command of facts and, uh, and history, and it's all such a uh, engaging well, narrative. And, I'm uh, afraid it's a little we'll, bit. We'll get to work. It, we'll, we'll get to work yeah. and get this down, and then uh, uh, we'll get your approval we'll on it. And I want to thank time. you for coming in today. Oh, sure. Did you want these pictures? I do, if I may. Oh, okay. I'll turn off the recorder now. Thank you. Now I want to see where Charles. Charles, uh, you off the recorder.